The Jerry Pal Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation. Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. And supported by listeners like you, many of whom have donated on the Jerry Pal fundraising site, which you can find at www.jerrypal.org, big blue button, or through reviews, stars on your favorite podcasting app. Big thank you. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? We're delighted to welcome Rick Gilfillan, who's a family doc. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast, Rick. Great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity, Alex. And we're also delighted to welcome Don Berwick, who's a pediatrician and senior fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and former administrator at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast, Don. Nice to be with you, Alex. Thank you. And joining us as a co-host, we have Alex Kasbrook, who's a geriatrics fellow at UCSF. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Alex K. Thank you so much, Alex S. So we are super excited to talk about this. We're going to be talking about... Uh, basically came from Don and Rick's uh, Health Affairs blog post on Medicare Advantage, Direct Contracting, and the Medicare Money Machine. We've got a lot to, to depack there, or unpack there. But before we do all of that, we always start off. Levity, uh, does anybody have a song request for Alex? I do. Alex, could we do Never Gonna Give You Up by <laughs> Rick Atsley? <laughs> and why? <laughs> why are you That's Rick rolling us? <laughs> you know, I think, I think the song really speaks to the idealized relationship between a Medicare Advantage plan and, uh, and a patient that may or may not exist in practice. Uh-huh. And the podcast has not yet been recrolled as far as I know. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Never going to say goodbye. Never going to tell a lie and hurt you. Right. Those are the lyrics. Also, I would add a great song that appeared in Ted Lasso in this last season um, as was featured, strangely enough, in a funeral scene. So here we go. Just a little bit of Never Going to Give You Up by Rick Astley. Here we go. No strangers to love You know the rules And so do I A full commitment's What I'm thinking of You wouldn't get this From any other guy I Just want to tell you how I'm feeling Gotta make you Understand Never gonna give you up Never gonna let you down Never gonna run around Desert you Never gonna make you cry, never gonna say goodbye, never gonna tell a lie and hurt you. <laughs> Does that count as a Rickroll, Alex, or do we actually have to link to, to him playing the song? <laughs> I don't know. I gotta understand my internet memes. I think I think it counts, especially if somebody was not expecting it. I think it counts. <laughs> <laughs> so uh let let's jump into the topic. I, I gotta say, uh Rick and Don, whenever I see stuff about ACOs and Medicare Advantage plans and MSPs, uh, you know, part of my brain shuts off. Like I just, I have difficulty understanding a lot of what's said. And I think I've read your health affairs blog post like three times, and I'm still trying to like piece out everything because it, yeah, maybe it's just me. I just don't, my brain doesn't work very well. But um, maybe we can take a step back and uh, would either of you be willing to just break down what are we talking about when we say a Medicare Advantage plan and how does it differ from you know, other things like HMOs, ACOs, Medicare? As befits my age, let me, let me start with the history and then turn it over to someone that actually knows what's going on, which is Rick. So back in the day, you know, Medicare which covers people over 65, was uh, set up in 1965 as part of the Great Society. And it was government insurance at that time, mainly for hospital care for older people. And it simply bought care on the open market, which meant you paid doctors to see patients, you paid hospitals to admit them and, and day charges. It was just fee-for-service medicine now covered by a government insurer, which was a great step forward. But as the 60s and 70s and 80s rolled on, it became clear that costs were rising fast, 
and that the fee-for-service payment system of what's called traditional Medicare had some problems, which it didn't have a way to control costs, and it didn't have a way to organize care. And that was the era when some of the more famous HMOs, Kaiser Permanente, for example, or Group Health Cooperative of Puget Sound or Harvard Community Health Plan were starting. And they were proving that when you had an integrated care system that could get paid uh, on a capitated basis, kind of in advance or or on on a population basis, that they could do things that the fee-for-care system couldn't. They could coordinate care. They can invest in stuff to help patients that there was no way to do in fee-for-service. And they had an incentive to keep people out of the hospital, which was a good thing because they had to find ways to take care of them and keep them from getting into the hospital in the first place by preventing deterioration or by helping them get out of the hospital faster and home where they should be. And they were performing pretty well, uh, something like 15% less expensive in, in many cases and pretty good quality of care. And so sensibly, it, Medicare and the Congress began saying, well, how can we give Medicare beneficiaries the benefit of this coordinated care, health, health maintenance care? And they decided to have an option in Medicare, wasn't called Medicare Advantage at the time, it was basically, gee, Medicare be- beneficiary, if you want to try to enroll in one of these integrated systems, go, go ahead and the government will pay the system instead of paying your doctor. And then this, the, the insurance system will then take care of you, which uh, was supposed to save money, reduce costs, and make care better. But what pretty quickly happened was not that that what happened was insurance companies began to offer not necessarily managed care, managed money, and and to cut a deal with the government where they get paid to take care of patients, and that evolved in the Medicare Advantage system. The rhetoric, the rhetoric is still the same, which is give us the money up front. We'll be able to organize care. We can take risk. We can invest where the money should be, and we can do better for patients. One of the problems with that is if, if you just have that deal, then insurance companies would go hunting for this for the patients who are really well because they're not going to cost them anything so they get paid money they can keep a lot of the money because the patients aren't going to need a lot of care so how could you create a system in which they've got an incentive to actually enroll people who really need the care and that requires case mix adjustments some form of risk adjustments so that when you're enrolling someone who has diabetes and congestive heart failure you get paid more because they're going to cost more and you're avid to enroll them that was the idea and so risk adjustment became had to become part of this Medicare Advantage system. One way to think of it is there are now two systems. There's the government is the insurer, traditional Medicare, or the government pays an insurer to take care of a beneficiary. Started off as a pretty low percentage of beneficiaries. Now about, I don't know, what is it, Rick? It's about 43, 44%, something like that of Medicare beneficiaries are in the Medicare Advantage space. They've chosen that. When you get turn 65, the government comes to you and says, you go to the government, say, I'm ready for Medicare. They say, which would you like, traditional Medicare or Medicare Advantage? That's how it all came to be. Maybe I'll turn it over to Rick if if you want to pick up the thread there and explain what happened then with this coding thing and eventually what what Rick is calling the Medicare money. Maybe before getting into coding and the specifics of risk adjustment, what does this look like for a patient? or a person coming in and how does one think about joining one of these MA plans? Sort of what what is the patient side of things? So just one other point of background I would add to Don's summary. So what has happened over the years from 1985 when they first came up with a privatized program until now, there have been these cycles of basically Congress ends up paying a little bit more because the plans find a way to not get, you know, to get the healthy people. So it ends up costing more than they would cost in fee-for-service. Congress cuts rates. They start losing membership. And so the membership goes down. Then Congress changes the rules and they get more money and they start growing again. So there have been multiple cycles of it kind of uh, expanding and shrinking over time. Each time more money has been put into it so that over the 35 years since it was started, it has never cost less. It's always cost more than uh, the fee-for-service system for different reasons. From an from a individual selecting standpoint, now I, you know, now it's um, it's October, end of October, beginning of November. It's open enrollment season. I'm a Medicare person. I can look at the enrollment stuff. It's it's just like when you have open enrollment when you're an, you're employed by somebody, right? Every once a year, you decide who you want coverage with. And a Medicare enrollee has a couple of choices. They can go with traditional Medicare, and many then also buy what's called Medicare supplement 
that is additional coverage because Medicare basically covers 80% of your costs with no out of pocket max. So you could spend a lot of money. So people buy typically buy supplemental insurance and you buy that through Blue Cross plan or whomever. And now you have med traditional Medicare and you have Medicare supplemental insurance. Okay. So that's um, typically the package that most people have. Some people have Medicaid to cover that. Some people are still employed, so their employer covers it. But basically, that's the basic, let's call that the traditional fee-for-service Medicare site. But that person also can say, I want to look and join a Medicare Advantage plan. And so they look at the marketing and sales materials that are available either online or maybe they know a broker or a broker contacts them and says, hey, look at this, consider this. Now they're looking at a different set of benefits. If Medicare traditional pays 80% of your costs, well, with a Medicare Advantage plan, typically the benefits are more like the in the employer insurance space, right? Well, maybe you have a $5, $10 copay to go see the primary and 20 to see the specialist. Maybe you have a, a, a co-insurance for the hospital admission. So they fit with the benefits, so the benefits are different. And then as a result of the extra payments that Medicare makes, some of that money is used to provide some extra benefits. So the, the fact is that now, right now, they can get, they might get Part D coverage, which is the drug plan, right? And on the traditional side, I have to buy drug uh, coverage, right? So I, maybe I pay $50, $60 a month to get drug coverage. Well, if I'm in the Medicare Advantage space, I may pay only 20 or 30, or I may, I may pay nothing. So they may get that extra benefit uh, from choosing the Medicare Advantage plan. The trade-off? Well, the Medicare Advantage plan has typically a narrow network, right? Virtually every provider in the country is in Medicare fee-for-service traditional Medicare, right? If I go to a Medicare Advantage plan, typically I'm going to have a more, a more narrow network. Oftentimes, as an example, you know, the big cancer hospitals, for instance, are not in the network because the, MA, the Medicare Advantage plans don't want to select people with cancer, right? So, so the networks are different. And Rick, can you give us some examples? Like, what are the the big MA plans in the U.S.? Well, United Healthcare is the biggest. Um, after that, Anthem, Blue Cross, which is in you know fourteen states. United is in all states, I believe, fifty states. Um, Anthem is in I don't know sixteen or seventeen, something like that. Yeah. And then you have Aetna, that's in virtually all states. Humana is another big one from Kentucky. They're in. A, limit, a more limited number of states, but they're a, uh, another very big plan. Then your local Blue Cross plans typically are big providers, right? The nonprofit Blues plans that are not part of Anthem yeah. uh, are big providers. Cigna has some. Uh, and then there's a variety of small, you know, HMO type uh, local companies that are in the business. Right each, now, of, I think I saw each of these uh, large plans will have several different kinds of NA plans. They don't, they don't have just one vanilla flavor. Yeah. It's gotten very complex. There's, I, there's something like a thousand or more than a thousand different MA plans that are sold across the country. Not a thousand different companies, but a thousand, more than a thousand flavors. And you said this kind of, we've been in cycles before, a lot of people, less people. Yeah. It sounds like over the last decade, there's been a, a, a a very rapid growth in yeah. uh, the population of older adults served by MA plans. I think in 2011, one in five Medicare decedents were under Medicare Advantage. Now in 2018, I think the last one I saw was one out of three are in Medicare Advantage. Is that is that what we're seeing, this trend? Yeah, bene beneficiaries. Beneficiaries. Right. Uh, yeah, there's right now, as Don says, about 42%. It's been a steady uphill uh, climb, I think, uh, pretty much since um, 2006 when risk adjustment went live and the, the entire uh, model was active. And yeah. since then, what happens is the risk, because risk adjusting ends up giving them extra money above fee for service, that extra money can be used to either add improved benefits or reduce premium costs to the beneficiary. And so the products have become more and more attractive over the last 15 years uh, to beneficiaries. It's a very it's a very weird market. So it's a Rick. It's called a perverse market. If you think about it, um, the plans can offer higher benefits and lower premiums, and the beneficiary is not paying for those, but someone is. That's coming from the government trust fund, or or in some cases from essentially transfers from traditional Medicare. So it's it's a great deal. I mean, someone else pays, and you get a better product, or you get a you get a lower cost. So obviously that favors growth. 
Plus, there's uh, much more marketing of the MA plans. They put a lot of money and effort into marketing. As you, if you, if you're my age and you open your mail any day, you're going to have three envelopes from some plan trying to sell you on moving into MA. So, so it's a weird market, and it has grown. If I may, point I should add to Alex's point: the, the other impact on the patient is the trade-off is some more benefits for a narrow network and putting up with the hassles of you know all the hassles that go with medical management of, you know, oh, you want to have a stress test. Okay, well, we'll schedule it in a week because we've got to get it pre-certified, right? Oh, you want to have your gallbladder out, you know, but we'll see if we approve it, right? So there's all that medical management is the other part that a patient thinks about, you know, when they try and make a decision about what insurance to get. So if I'm a patient or recommending this to my patient, it seems like it might be a good deal, right? I get... To pay less money, I get extra benefits, sometimes drug coverage, in some cases, maybe vision or even dental to an extent. What is the data on outcomes? Do people in MA plans do better? Do they live longer? You know, it's uh, it, the answer is, I think it's fair to say, there's an organization called MedPAC, right? And they are the Medi Medicare Payment Advisory Council or Commission, sorry. And they are basically, um, the advisors to Congress on what to do with the med Medicare program. And they, they're probably the most intensive uh, evaluations of everything Medicare that of anybody out there, I would say. And they would say, basically, you really can't say very much about the quality differences between Medicare traditional and Medicare people service. They're, they're, if you ask the Medicare Advantage folks, they say, oh my God, we got all sorts of evidence about, you know, we're much better. The reality is that the evidence is pretty thin, some of it is uh, incomparability of statistics gathered in the two uh, marketplaces. There's not a lot of the same data. From a mortality standpoint, the interesting thing is um, people who stay in Medicare versus uh, tend to be the sicker population. And so the latest data on mortality is that people in um, Medicare Advantage actually have, they do have lower mortality rates. And the reason is because the sicker people stay in Medicare and sicker people go from Medicare Advantage back into Medicare if they want to get, you know, access to hospitals they don't have on the Medicare side that they have from. So typically what happens, what they what research shows is that the initial the uh, mortality rates are lower in Medicare Advantage due to that. But over time, they actually become over, uh, I think it is three to five years, they become the same as in um, Medicare Advantage. So there's no a Medicare fee -to service. So there's no evidence of better outcomes, I think I would say. Maybe they do better with breast cancer screening and um, uh, colorectal screening and stuff. There's some evidence of that. But by and large, there's not a whole lot of difference from the quality perspective. And this is confounded by the coding stuff we'll get to because if the coding game is leading the Medicare Advantage plans to code a lot of diagnoses that are not coded <clears throat> on the original side, when you try to compare outcomes, you've got you haven't got apples to apples. You've got one group that's been upcoded in Medicare Advantage who to look sicker. Therefore, the bat the 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 the, uh, the bar has been lowered to to making their to making their, their outcomes look better. So it's really really hard to evaluate this stuff. Well, I let's think talk we about that. Said the um, med we trust MedPAC a lot. They they're very diligent, and a lot of the evaluations that have evaluate tours that have shown some advantage to Medicare Advantage have been hired by Medicare Advantage due to the evaluation. So I don't know. I just I I'd be cautious about saying we really know that they're better. So let's talk about that coding. So when I think of coding, like you have a seventy six year old with hypertension, osteoporosis, some mild COPD, you got some objective data. You got a diagnosis. Shouldn't I mean that? Is it all like where is the gamification of that? Because it is what it is, right? Like yeah. you, you have the you have the diagnoses, the signs to a code, and then everybody should be playing in the same level playing field. Yeah. Well, let let's let's st uh, step back for a moment and put yourself in primary care practice out. You know, private practice, right? And you're seeing a Medicare, any patient, you see, it doesn't matter if they're Medicare or not Medicare. You know, you submit a claim, right? Because you want to get paid. And to get paid, you need a diagnosis, right? So I submit a diagnosis, osteoporosis, let's say, right? And now I get paid. I get my office to the paid, right? I don't worry about 
finding 15 codes to put on the claim, right? I just put one claim on it, right? So that claim goes into the Medicare database, right? So kind of by definition, the traditional fee-for-service database is undercoded, okay? It, it doesn't have all the codes that one could find if you diligently saw it every possible diagnosis, old and new, right? So now Medicare says, I got to create a risk adjustment system and I'm going to allocate the costs of this population of people. I'm going to allocate that cost across their diagnosis, right? And I'm going to figure out how much is osteoporosis worth? Maybe it costs, you know, $1,000 more in, in my Medicare fee for service population. So I take basically all the dollars I spend, the entire dollar amount I spend, and I divide it by the number of diagnosis codes, which are rolled up into categories called hierarchical condition categories, HCCs, right? And this is like a hundred of them. They're kind of like DRGs almost, right? But for outpatient stuff. And you say, okay, these are diagnosis categories. Well, in, in the FIFA service world, when you, the, the denominator, the number of HCCs is smaller, right? because I don't submit a lot of codes. So if I divide that small number into my total cost for the population, right? I might find that on average, everybody has two HCCs that are worth, you know, um, $2,000 each, right? And with my, if I put a demographic factor in, that, that accounts for the rest of their cost. So now I have, on, on, let's say on average, I have all these HCCs and I value them at $2,000 for every HCC on average, right? Now, if I go over to Medicare Advantage, I take the same people, right? I've converted them to Medicare Advantage, the same people. They have the same total cost, right? And I calculate their traditional Medicare cost per diagnosis, per HCC. And I use that number to calculate how much they're gonna cost in Medicare Advantage. The one difference is I now have the ability and a reason to get every diagnosis I can get, right? And I, I still get $2,000 per diagnosis, but if I can collect twice as many diagnoses, twice as many HCCs, I get paid twice as much, right? So that's the, that's the reason why people at times, you know, you hear from people complaining, my God, they want me to put down, you know, amputation was 10 years ago. You know, and they want me to put down, you know, diabetes with this kind of complication, not that, no, not just plain diabetes, right? Because that is the hunt for more and more HCC codes. Hmm. So the HCC codes are based on fewer diagnosis. Therefore, each one is worth more. And I now in the MA world, I go out and I get as many diagnoses. Is that, is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. So why, why is that? necessarily a bad thing, right? You can make the case that, okay, if the patient does have all of these conditions, How much it's actually you... good to accurately document all of them. Oh, oh, accurately document is a wonderful thing, yeah. But the problem is, it's not, doing what I described is not fraud, right? The problem is that the, that the dollar amounts associated with HCCs, each HCC is wrong, right? It should be much less in this population. Because the same people cost the same amount of money, right? If they cost $10,000 a year in fee for service, they're going to cost roughly $10,000 a year in the uh, Medicare Advantage space, right? The only, the catch is I'm overpaying because the dollar amount associated with that diagnosis is not based on me having all the codes. It's based on me having too few codes, mm. right? So that's the overpayment is created by me getting a lot more codes paid at an inflated amount. It's not fraud. It's just smart business practice. No, so I mean, something, it, the way I think about it is if it, um, back on the traditional side, the patients were getting their care. I might not have written down every code the patient has, but they're getting their care. When I move over to the Medicare Advantage space, now every time I add a code, I get more money. But that doesn't mean the healthcare costs have gone up. I'm going to take care of that. That's the same patient, identical patient. We're just adding more money based on the codes that aren't, that doesn't translate to actually different costs for caring for that patient. It's yeah. uh, it, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It so reminds, it's, it's, it reminds me of a, a quote I once heard from a really smart person. Every system is perfectly designed to get the result it gets. 
some guy named Don. So these MA, I'm going to your blog post now. I, some of these MA plans are also using what, artificial intelligence and creating systems to help really increase the coding of this. Yeah, there's, so there's, no, there's no bad yeah. way to find a code. Any way you can find a code, do it with AI, yeah. do it with a nurse visiting home, do it by asking the patient a lot of questions. Um, yeah. Or take your example, right? You said the typical patient, what, they had osteoporosis, hypertension, maybe a little COPD, right? Yeah. She's sitting in front of you right now, and you got a note from your um, uh, your MA plan. They said, your patient has a 50% chance of having carotid uh, atherosclerosis. Do an ultrasound on her carotids and see if she has asymptomatic. You can't hear a brew or anything, right? But just do a... Oh, do an no. ultrasound, and so now go. So now, now you order an ultrasound, right? Oh no! Uh, and she's oh yeah, she's got yeah, she's got asymptomatic, you know, carotid plaque, right? Well, you're not hopefully you're not going to do anything, right? But you're going to put the diagnosis down. It's going to get twenty six hundred dollars a year more to your insurance company. Oh, the, uh, you got it. I get it now. <laughs> that case is Rick and I've written about it. The, the uh, I was vice chair of the preventive services task force. Uh, the current task force guidance is um, carotid or artery screening uh, gets a D, which means there's substantial evidence against doing it. It's not just we don't know. It's we know not to do it. And yet on the MA side, you do it, you get paid, you know, $2,600 yep. $2, or it's um, very perverse. Right. And then now you're a nurse out doing the home visit, right? I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of nursing home visits. Are being done right nursing collect home, nurse home visits. nurse home visits sorry yeah yeah you go in and what are they equipped with well well they're carrying you know a little they got a little um little diagnostic kit right does a little peripheral vascular screen right so you've got cold feet seriously right and they basically do on everybody they do this peripheral vascular exam because now they can document you know peripheral vascular disease if they get, you know, such and such a reading on the ultrasound or whatever the, uh, you know, the digital readout is from, I guess it's uh, something on the toe or whatever. So th those, that's what, that's what happens, right? So now uh, that's all the help. When we wrote the article, we talked about three ways to get more codes, right? I need more codes for the reasons we've described. How do you get them? One, just pay the doctor more. You give them a metric and say, look, I'm going to track how many codes you get. And if you get all the codes I think you, I tell you are there to be gotten, I'll give you more money, right? That's one way to do it. And they, the single largest use of machine learning is to do this, right? Because it's so lucrative. Um, so that's one way to do it. The second way they do it is they basically say to you, now, doctor, I'm going to give you a deal, okay? I'm going to give you a risk deal. And I'm going to put you at risk for the total cost of care for that population, right? That's $1,000 per person per month, right? And if, if you can beat my target of $850, 85%, then, um, you know, you, you can keep the difference. But, hey, suppose you just do that ultrasound on everybody and increase the premium by $2,600. Now... Your target stays the same, but your premium has gone up by that $2,600, right? That's about $200 per person per month, right? 12 times $200, $2,400. Well, if I do that, now I'm the doctor, right? If I have that deal that they gave me, now the premium goes way up, right? And I get 85% of the premium in my target. So all that extra money becomes my incentive payment. So ordinarily, a primary care doc gets like $40 per member per month for providing care. Suddenly, they're getting $240 per person per month, right? That's an enormous amount of money wow. that they've gotten. And that's the money machine, the ability to supplement, to submit those codes and generate that money. And it all just like drops right through into incentive payment for me, the geriatrician. And if you're... A geriatrician or a primary care doctor, that doesn't sound too bad, right? Primary care in this country is underfunded, what, four to five percent of total spend. And um, now you're saying, hey, if I do these things, some of which are maybe not useful, but some of them, who knows, maybe having that nurse come by once in a while, 
to do silly things, there's there's benefit to it. So pivoting a little bit from the insurance side of things, I know there are all these startups, um, yeah. Oak Street, uh, Iora, others um, that you write about yeah. that try to do this and try to say, look, we will partner with an A plans and we will try to do more um, services sometimes for our patients. Um, what's what's the goal there and what are the issues? The goal there is they're just, they are the, the system, but they see the patient more and that's a good thing. You know, that probably is a good thing. Hopefully it's a good thing seeing, you know, I mean, some of them see a patient every month, so they'd be sure to get every possible code, get their scores from one up to 1.7, right? And, and collect 70% more premium, right? Enormous amounts of money. Uh, as a primary care doc, you know, on average, you're making $240,000. You get your scores up to 1.3, you're making a million, right? So it's not like a little bit more money for primary care or for primary care practices. It's like four times the amount of money, right, that you're getting. So um, basically, that's the game that they're trying to pursue, and they're really good at it, right? They've got these AI tools that say, Mrs. Jones, she's got this, she got that. I bet she's got that, right? Check for it, you know? Uh, so the answer is they're the for-profit companies now are basically generating that revenue. Not much of it is going necessarily to the primary care doc, right? It's going to the organization, which is ultimately going to shareholders and uh, uh, stockholders. Um, presumably as uh, profits, dividends, buybacks, stock buybacks, whatever. Um, let, let me play with Alex's question a little more, Rick, and, and yeah. see what you think. Um, uh, first, the, the last point Rick made, the, the, the three deals of the money machine that we see, one is pay the doc to code more. That's the AI machine learning piece. Just we'll pay you 30 extra bucks if you use our software to find an extra code on a visit. The second is give the do the premium, the, the percent of premium sharing with the docs, which is a little more complicated, but it's very lucrative. The third is buy the docs. So that's why United is now the largest single employer of physicians. Why not own the whole game? If the game's so lucrative, why give that money back to the to the pr provision of care? Let's let's keep it. Um the um but but your question has is is deep because it is true. If you look at say Iora, which is one of the ones that I've known for many years. There are innovations there. There's no question that some of these plans have done some wonderful things in inventing new approaches to care, low panel sizes, and really intensive monitoring of patients. Uh, the Chen Med's favorite, fav famous for that. Iora does that. Flexibility and benefits. You know, in, in Iora, if you need a taxi to take you home or to the see the doctor, you get a taxi. It's, it's they don't even quibble about that. Um, a lot of integrated care with mental health and social work. All these are innovations that come out of the managed care world. The problem, the question I have is, well, what, what toll do we have to pay for that? Isn't there a way to finance care at 18% of GDP or less that gives that kind of flexibility to people to give care, but without the 15% toll that the insurance companies take out of an MA, without putting barriers in front of patients and pre-certification and reviews and delays? Um, do we really have to pay this excess price through MA? And I think no. The MA plans say, oh, yes, you do. Now, that's how we actually get the, uh, the care of the future invented. But I, I, I do not, I dispute that MA is the font of innovation in the kind of re reconfiguration of care that your question's about, Alex. There's a baby in this bathwater. There's no question. But I say, get rid of the bathwater and let's figure out smarter ways to support inventive care. Rick, you, you may, I don't know if you see it the same way I do. Yeah, I well, yeah, I do. And I think let's, let's you know, go back a moment and say, so what is this ACO thing that gives you a headache, right? Yeah, and the, let's go back. Remember traditional Medicare, right? So in traditional Medicare, what we said was, um, this goes back to like 2010. I was at the Innovation Center Don, working for Don at CMS, right? And this whole idea of ACOs, accountable care organizations, in, that's in the traditional Medicare side. And what we said was, maybe if we create a contract with a group of doctors who can manage, who will commit to managing that care like those HMOs did, may, just maybe they can save money too, and we'll create a program where if there are savings, they will get it. Oh, and by the way, we won't give them the easy money of the risk coding. We gave them a little bit of a margin, like 3% they could go up as opposed to the 30, 40, 50, 60% the other guys are doing. And speak, it can go up and go down. Uh, so we basically, that was the idea of ACO. So that's what an ACO is. Primary care doctors, 
We say, okay, um, we'll fi- figure out what Medicare people you're saying you're seeing. We'll give you, uh, we'll make, we'll assign them to you or align them with you, and we'll give you a, a total cost of care target based on the historical experience. If you can save money, you can save. And so that's the ACO side of this. That's kind of going to saying, let's go directly to the providers and do it and basically not pay the 15% we pay to the insurers, right? So how much good can they do? That's what's been going on as an experiment for the last 10 years. But one of the problems with the account, with the MA is because the money's so easy, they basically pull people away from doing that well, frankly. And we didn't make the deal as attractive as we probably should have at this point. And so people aren't investing much that much in in the in the, that ACO care model. Yeah. The results have been a, on average a couple of percent better in terms of saving money. There's been been savings and people have made some money, but um, it hasn't been as much as we would have liked. But it's that it, that's the comparison, if you will, tr- until last year that was uh, relevant. ACOs versus MA and how are they doing? And can I ask, you know, so you did two parts to your health affairs blog post. We'll have a yeah. link to it on our on our show notes. Um, the second part was really talking about a backdoor towards privatizing Medicare. Yeah. I want to be mindful of the time. We only have about 10 minutes left. Can you give the viewers just like a you know a, a brief like description of what was part two about? What is this backdoor that you're talking about? Yeah. Well, so that was the ACO model, right? And that was between CMS, a direct contract between CMS and providers, be they doctors or doctors and hospitals, whatever, right? On the traditional Medicare side, that's that's traditional Medicare now being trying to figure out a way to help doctors be more inventive with the money. Right. And so then, you know, the Trump administration was interested in just privatizing the whole thing. I mean, they said that explicitly, you know, basically wanted to get CMS out of the way and give all the money to the private sector. So they created a couple versions of what they called, originally it was called direct provider contracting. They struck the direct the provider out of it and made it direct contracting because they wanted to get the um, for-profit companies, the insurers involved in some of these startups, right? So they call it direct contracting. And they took the eight, the direct con- the ACO model, and which was limited to providers, and said, oh, we'll make that available to insurance companies. And will give them the opportunity to get that same kind of a capitation check they get in MA for the total cost of care, right? And we'll do a variety of other things to make it a little bit easier for them to be successful versus the ACLs. So that was kind of like the back door. There were several versions of it. The one that is operating is called uh, direct contracting global professional model. And basically there are about 53 entities, Uh, 28 of them are these for-profit driven insurers and or um, MA firm focused firms. And they said, let's get the firms that are really doing business in MA only and get them to come over into this traditional side. And so that, when we say the back door to privatization, it's just getting them to those same MA style players into the traditional book of business. The other, the other okay. side of this is more about beneficiaries. So I'm, I'm a Medicare beneficiary and each year I get to choose whether it be in traditional Medicare or Medicare Advantage, I choose traditional Medicare. I want the flexibility of not being in a limited network. And I, I have some concerns about behaviors of some of the MA plans. So I chose traditional Medicare explicitly, as does any other beneficiary in traditional Medicare. The direct contracting model proposes to basically put me in, in a Medicare-like advantage model. I have the opt-out and there's less restriction on where I can go. It's a little more open. But suddenly, I who chose the traditional route uh, find myself in in an MA in an MA like situation, and that's part of the concern about the direct contracting model. Interesting. So this is this is complicated. It is complicated. It is challenging to make many changes all at once. Um, if there was a magic wand or a way to make a significant change um, to one or two things, no more than that, um, Don, what would that one or two thing be? And then same to Rick. I build on the ACO direction. I think we ought to be heading toward a direct provider contracting model like the ACO and more and more make the payment be literally global payments or population-based payments to providers of care without the insurance company in the middle uh, and certainly without venture capital firms in the middle. I, 
We to do that, we need a way to find. We need a way to support uh, practices uh, to take the risk and manage care. But I think we could do that without all the tools of MA and uh, and the, uh, the kind of the tie of Medicare Advantage. At this point, Medicare Advantage exists and it's not going to go away. It doesn't look like it. So the other part of my plan would be to change the coding model so the Medicare Advantage plans still have risk coded patients, but those patients are coded according to the actual risk they have. Like, do they live in areas of deprivation? Are they people very likely to be ill? And do the adjustment based on their real needs of the population, not just how clever the coding system can be. Last question from me. Um, you've described this as a Medicare gold rush, and there's been great investment by so venture capitalists and others. I just wonder if you could say a little bit about, about that. Yeah, so um, the money machine, right, is what that we described is what turns these primary care practices or MA plans into very valuable commodities, right? And so what happens? Well, Wall Street sees these as, you know, growth opportunities, right? Oh my God, the Medicare is now spending, you know, com coming up on, 900 uh, billion a year it's going to go to 1.5 trillion a year there's no other industry that's going to grow like that right i mean it's it's a lot of money so um what happens is you get you know you get initial investments and investors first you know investing in one or two uh, of these models and they you start getting this kind of frothy uh storyline that people tell about how, how much money they make. And by the way, all of them kind of tell the risk coding story, albeit a little bit, you know, uh, a little bit camouflaged, but it's there. Uh, and then you say, oh, by the way, direct contracting, now it can take, if, it, if MA was only 50%, now I get the whole 100% of 1.5 trillion in place. And mm -hmm. so these all these guys rushed to do an IPO or to do a SPAC, right? And sequentially each valuation went up higher and higher and higher and so if historically ma medicare advantage plans were valued based on how much how many members they have right so dollars per member was you know it was four thousand then it went up a little bit to eight nine ten thousand suddenly now we got people who are up over a hundred thousand dollars per wow. person because this the the money machine opportunity it, it so far it hasn't hit a limit right mm -hmm. if you right now risk scores are increasing two percent a year faster in medicare advantage than you know what happens with the traditional aging population mm -hmm. that's pre projected medicare, to be 600 dude. billion dollars in excess payments over the next eight years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and rick uh our magic wand had a little bit of less leftover energy what what do you want to do anything else for your magic wand what would you do to to change this. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I think I would, um, as Don, I would agree with what Don said. I think it's also, the reality is that, yeah, we need to pay primary care docs, more, but we can, this is, we should not have contracts that allow people to control the premium to make more profit, right? I think those contracts, CMS and Congress needs to create uh, rules around um, eliminating, limiting the amount of, um, incentives that can be driven by the money machine model. I, I would re much rather see us get a different model entirely that, as Don said, it's based on, you know, demographics, social deprivation index, yeah. um, and, and uh, some uh, surveys of beneficiaries to find out their illnesses. Um, but I think also we want to make sure that we don't allow this kind of basically corporatization um, of, of of primary care, which is what's happening, uh, unfortunately, right now, because of this mm -hmm. uh, excess profits that are being driven. Uh, well, I want to thank both of you. It just because we brought up uh, area deprivation index, we also did a great podcast with Amy Kind on the neighborhood oh, uh, uh, area deprivation index. Um, yeah. I also want to say this is part one of a two part series on MA plans. We'll have Cheryl Phillips, president of Special Needs Plan Alliance, and Claire Anacunda, um, who is a health service researcher focused on hospice care and MA plans. Yeah, great. No, one more. If I want to pretend I'm a good interviewer for that next podcast, would there be one question that you guys would have around hospice and MA plans or the Special Need Plan Alliance for Cheryl Phillips and Claire? Bring your risk scores. Bring your risk scores, and show me the trend on your risk scores. Yeah. 
Uh, how about for you, Don? One question that we should ask them. If you wanted to get paid the best way to do the best for your patients, how would that be compared to what it is today? Great. Well, um, we promise that our next podcast is not just going to be a Rick roll, but <laughs> we'll end on a little Rick roll. Alex. <laughs> We've known each other for so long Your heart's been aching but you're too shy to say it Inside we both know what's been going on We know the game and we're gonna play it I just wanna tell you how I'm feeling Gotta make you understand Never gonna give you up Never gonna let you down Never gonna run around Desert you Never gonna make you cry Never gonna say goodbye Never gonna tell a lie And hurt you Nice. Well done. Well done. Don, uh, Rick, and Alex, big thank you for joining us on this Jerry Palka podcast. I know your days are busy. I got to say, though, my mental blockage on MA plans is slowly dissolving. I understand a little bit better. And for God's sakes, like I'm an academic geriatrician and palliative care doctor, and I have like difficulty with this. I think you guys did a good job of really distilling it down. So very thank big so thank you. Thanks for uh, letting us try. Thanks for the opportunity. And... A very big thank you to Artstone Foundation for your continued support and to all of our listeners for supporting us. And for those who are supporting us on the Jerry Powell donation site to continue this uh, podcast, including uh, Meg Walhagen, who uh, is one of our generous donors. We'd also like to thank our listeners who are supporting the Jerry Powell podcast at at least the $250 level. And those include Meg Walhagen, Thomas Quinn, Rochelle Bernacki, Louise Aronson, James Tulsky. Arden O'Donnell, Mike Steinman, Marianne Forcia, Ashok Krishnaswamy, Nancy Lundeberg, and Gail Cooney. Hey, Eric, we should say also that you know our thanks and admiration go out to you and the, the entire team at UCSF and the care you're giving during these, you know, the incredible um, two years we've had with COVID. So, well done. Well, thank you very much. It's been a it's been a heck of a two years. Thanks for everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.